And as a reminder, many of us are new to each other and we'd like to ask you to embrace this awesome diversity and newness and approach the conversation and each other with honesty and openness because that's what's going to make tonight special. Um, I want to make sure that we thank those who make her Torah possible. First, Rabbanit Eliza Sperling, the director of her Torah, for your immense thoughtfulness and dedication and just complete devotion and creativity in building these amazing opportunities for us to learn with and from each other. A big thank you to the Aviv Foundation for their faith in her Torah to create a unique way of learning together in community. Um, I really want to stop talking so that we can listen to our incredible educators instead, so I'm going to be quick with a little bit of housekeeping. I hope that tonight is just one of the many chances that we get to see your beautiful faces because we have much more coming up, including after Memorial Day weekend, we have our next Her Health conversation, which is called 90 Minutes in the Red Tent, an intergenerational conversation about Jewish women's bodies on Tuesday, May 31st. Do not miss this one. I promise you, do not miss this one. Um, it's going to be amazing. We have Dr. Suzanne Gilbert Lenz, who is a renowned OBGYN and founder of Menopause Boot Camps, which are wild and crazy and I loved learning about. Sarah Barak, who is a sexual health expert, and Rabbi Sarah Luria, who's the founder of Immerse NYC New Mikvah Movement and the beloved network of revolutionary Jewish communities. Um, you can find out more on our website, and I will definitely follow up with an email, but if you have time to come and pop into that one, please join us for that because that's going to be a whole host of fun in a different way. Um, if we don't mind, I just want to share some of our expectations for how we gather tonight. Thank you so much. Um, please respect everyone here. Show up as your fabulous self, hot mess, laundry piles, cats across the screen, all are very welcome. An agreement that what happens here stays here. So anything that comes up in conversation, in the chat, just is something that remains here tonight unless you have permission to share it from the person who offered it. Um, please introduce yourself to someone new in the chat. If you see, you know, just as an experiment, if you find somebody who has the first initials that match yours, just reach out and say hello, introduce yourself. Tell them that you like their artwork behind them, whatever it is, um, because you should all know each other. We should all know each other. It's a, a gift to be able to meet new people and get to know new people. Um, thank you so much for, you can take down the screen share. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Also, if you don't mind, make sure your name is listed as it would be a name tag if we were together in person. If you consider showing us your beautiful face, that would be fabulous. We don't care if you're in your ratty pajamas or washing dishes at the same time. Um, I can promise you that that's exactly what's going on behind the very strategically placed Steve Ass sign behind me. Thank you. Um, and a favor to ask of all of you, in the process of our learning, we have a very beautifully diverse group here tonight. And in all of our conversations, it is it always happens that someone references something that not everyone will understand. A word in Hebrew, a cultural phrase, a, a reference to an author, something like that. If you hear something mentioned, can we just as a collective, as a community, pitch in and make sure that everyone is on the same page? So if you hear something mentioned that could use some more explanation or a further definition, just add it in the chat because I'm sure if you thought it needed it, it definitely did. And if you have a question, I'm sure someone else has a question. So I definitely don't keep up with the chat and I would love the help. So that would be amazing. And also we're going to use the chat tonight heavily to have conversations with each other while we're interacting and learning. Um, so if you don't mind, please start off by introducing yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're Zooming from tonight. And if you're comfortable, since tonight is about some amazing biblical women, share the name of a woman who has impacted your life in some way. Uh, that would be awesome and a chance to celebrate some other spectacular ladies. Um, I'm really glad to be in a community of learning with each of you tonight with the chance to learn from these exceptional educators. Um, and I'll confess, <laughs> when Steve I wasn't yet something real, and uh, I was still imagining what might be. I often found myself kind of 
fascinatingly imagining the scene at the foot of Mount Sinai after Revelation, after the Torah was given to the Jewish people. Um, and I imagine the women. I imagine them gathered around the cook fire discussing the happenings of the day. And my, my little dream kind of stops there. And um, I was just always like wishing or aching to hear what they were sharing with each other around that cook fire. Um, I used to read <laughs> those uh, choose your own adventure books as a kid, you know, where if you, you want to go one direction, you read that way. And if you want to go another direction, you read another way. And I was definitely the total geek who read all the different options and the story <laughs> ended in 700 different ways. Um, so I kind of look at that post-revelation cook fire in the same way. What would have happened if we had followed those women after they received the Torah? What would our Jewish heritage have looked like? Um, how would our Judaism have been shaped differently if we had heard what they had been sharing and saying uh, after they received the Torah? So tonight feels a little bit like I get to turn the pages of the book back and imagine what if together with you. So thank you to you and to our amazing educators for being here and bringing some beautiful Torah to life tonight. Uh, and with that, I get to introduce one of my favorite teachers of all time, Rabbanit Eliza Sperling, the director and visionary behind all of her Torah. You'll see her bio in the chat and she will start us off. Thank you so much, Ariella. Hello, everybody. It's so good to see you. Um, thank you, Ariella, for everything that you do for Sviva and for her Torah and um, to bring women together. Uh, her Torah tries to bring Jewish women of every background, um, any denomination, tries to bring us all together over a shared text so that we can have real conversations together and share what's important in the Torah of our own lives. I am so excited about the wonderful uh, teachers we have tonight. And I have to say that um, I'm especially excited to be learning uh, Megillat Ruth, the Book of Ruth tonight, uh, after a very hard day. Um, I'm sure all of us have had a very hard day and a very hard, uh, you know, past couple of weeks, Buffalo and then Texas. Um, these are moments where you say to yourself, I, I wish there was something I could do, but I kind of feel helpless. I feel like there's nothing I can do. Um, and where, where, are the lead, where are the leaders? Where, what, are, what are the actions that we can take? Um, and one of the reasons I love the book of Root is because it starts off in a very hard place where um, Naomi and Root and Orpah are struck by tragedy. And um, that, but that's only chapter one of the book. Ch chapters, the rest of chapter one, chapters two, three, and four are the continuation, what happens afterwards, what they do, how they respond, how the society responds. And I heard this really great piece of Torah about the book of Ruth that has stayed for me with me for years, that the book of Job and the book of Ruth, Rabbi um, Bazak uh, writes this, both start off in the same way. They both start off with tragedy, with somebody losing their family. But those, these two books, we look at them in totally different ways. The book of Job is a book of mourning and of tragedy. When people say, you know, when people think about the book of Job, they think about all the horrible things that happened to Job. Because what happens is that this happens to Job and then there's no, there's no moving forward. They just kind of all sit and they talk about why has this happened. But with the book of Ruth, tragedy strikes and then everybody goes into action. Ruth follows Naomi. Um, the society in Israel um, provides for these two poor women. Uh, Boaz takes a leadership role and he brings them in um, even when it's not popular. And so even though the two books start off in the same way, we look at them completely differently because of the ways that people respond. And my, my hope for all of us is that somehow we can all as a society find a way to move forward, to take the steps that are necessary, even when it feels like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the next steps are. 
uh, at the end of our time tonight, we'll give you some suggestions about some things that we might be able to do together. But I invite you in the meantime, before we start our learning, if you have an idea of something that uh, you've heard or you think is an important thing to do at this moment, as we're about to read the book of Ruth together, um, give us some ideas of action, of action in terms of spiritual action, in terms of reaching out to the victims, in terms of um, adv advocating for uh, what you believe is right. So please put in the chat what, what you think so that the rest of us can learn from you. I now want to start our uh, learning of the Book of Ruth by introducing to you a wonderful friend and colleague, Rabbitson Elisa Bulow. Rabbitson Elisa Bulow is the founding director of CORE, an organization that supports women as they strengthen the Jewish people. She is also an author, educator, and mentor to Jewish communal leaders and lay people around the world. Before founding CORE, she directed Nerla Elef's North American Women's Program for 11 years, where she coached Rebitsons and provided strategic development for outreach organizations in Canada, the US, and Mexico. And you can see the rest of her bio that's going to be put in the chat. Um, Eliza is an amazing, as you'll see, she's an amazing teacher, and she brings her life experience and wisdom and the text together in really beautiful ways. I'm so happy that you're here, Lisa. Thank you so much, Eliza. Um, <laughs> it's, I um, actually looked up the word this week for resilience. I wasn't sure how to say resilience in Hebrew. And I found that one of the translations in Hebrew is Aliz. And I was so excited to see that. <laughs> because I really feel like there's strong resilience in um, anyway, in, in some of the ways that I look at things and that I try to teach things. So um, I felt like I found my, my prophecy in choosing that name uh, in terms of the resilience. So um, I've loved working with Eliza over the years and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for um, inviting me. Um, okay, so I am a first generation Jew I chose in, and that could be one reason, although I'm sure it's not the only reason that I was chosen to teach this parak. And um, I often find, I wrote an article, you can find it in the Bodies and Souls Shavuos edition um, called Convert Season about how people hunt for converts. It is convert season during this pre-Shavuot, um, pre-Ruth reading and what people want out of converts during this time. I'll let you find that essay at another time, but I wanna to talk to you um, about the names that are here very quickly. Um, <clears throat> and they're so graphic. The name's Elimelech, to me, kingship. The name Naomi, I am pleasant. Machlon and Kilian, their children, destruction and sickness. They're horrible names. <laughs> Who names a child that? I often wonder like, you know, I, I don't know who picks a, a name you know, you just think about Naomi pushing the baby stroller and somebody says, oh, your baby's so cute. What's his name? Just destruction. What are you supposed to say to that? <laughs> what kind of a name is that that she gave her children? Um, but the name is there. And Elimelech, let's look at that one for a minute, because that means to me, kingship. And he was considered somebody in leadership at the time. And there was a famine in the land and off he goes to abandon his people into a place where there's food. He says, I, I have a family to take care of and I, I don't want to take care of all the poor people that are knocking on my door. And so I'm just going to scoop my family up and go to greener pastures. And right away, of course, a father should do that. A father should care for his family. And also when you have a name like to me is the king, you actually have to look around and see what's your responsibility communally. And he didn't. And so that brings us into the sorrow of the opening of the chapter of his death and his son's death. And, and left over now is Naomi with her two daughters-in-law. And, and she kisses them and Orpah leaves. Orpah, by the way, um, is who, um, uh, what's her name now? Um, anyway, ah, why did I forget her name? The talk show host. Oprah. Thank you. Oprah is named after Orpa. Um, <laughs> she is. And, and that makes me think about Arielle. 
<laughs> whose parents spell their names differently than what they imagined. Just like my mother-in-law, um, Tova Lea Bulo, her parents spelled it just like it is in Hebrew. Lea, Lamed Aleph He, L-A-H. And they just added an A because they thought they needed to be another letter there. So it's Tova Laha, but it's really Tova Lea. So um, anyway, Orpa leaves the story. And she actually, Orpa is, Orpa is the back of one's neck. So she turns the back of her neck to Naomi as she goes off. But Ruth decides she wants to stay. And we have the famous story there of where you go, I'll go. She says, no, 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 don't follow me. She says, where you sleep, I'll sleep. She says, really go back home. She says, whatever you do, I'm going to do. Wherever you die, that's where I'll be buried. Look, I am with you. I am down for the count like in this process with you. I'm not leaving. And so, um, so Ruth stays. So that's the basic. And then they go back together. Right? She has her conversion. And there's lots of questions about when did she convert? What was the conversion? Was it before she married her son? Was it after? There's, and I'm not going to go into those because I have a few other things that I want to bring here. So why do we read this book, this story of this conversion? And what happens afterwards? Why do we read this for Shavuot? So th there's a lot of answers. Well, one answer is it's timely. It's about the harvest time. And right now we're counting the Omer and this is the harvest time and it kind of fits in nicely with the time. Another answer is chesed, chesed, loving kindness. Ruth really brought into the Jewish people a vitamin of loving kindness that we were missing in our daily diet, which is why, um, which is what caused the, the exit of Elimelech in the first place is he was a little lean on the chesed side. He's like, I, I don't feel like being so loving and kind to all these people that are knocking on my door. I think I'm gonna leave. And um, he took away with him, not just the leadership capacity, but the, the chesed vacuum that was there. And Ruth came to bring it back. So we see how necessary chesed is as an ingredient for Torah. But really it helps us see the whole concept of our midot, our character traits, as a necessary ingredient for receiving Torah. Our midot are how we measure up. Midot means character traits, but it also means measurements. So just like think about Mary Poppins taking out her measuring tape and she measures up I need to know what happens with Mary Poppins. Um, I think Elisa is having some computer issues. Let's give her a couple minutes. In the meantime, I'm reading through all of these mentionings of amazing women and I'm like just flabbergasted and loving it so much. We're back, right? Yay. Okay, good, good. <laughs> that was scary. Um, I never had that happen before. Um, anyway, our measurements are what hold the Torah that's poured into us. And so reading this book can remind us of that at this time that we're about to receive the Torah and we need to shape up our midot so that we'll be able to receive it. So we see the different character traits that are displayed in this book, some good and some bad. Number three reason is the lineage of King David. Apparently he was born and died on Shavuot. Um, so there's lots of um, discussion of that in, in our other sources of what that means. But we do want to shore up his lineage at this point because he has a shady lineage. He comes from a convert. And how could a king come from a convert? Not just a convert. Maybe a king can come from a convert, but not that kind. Like there's some kinds we don't like. So Moabite converts and Ammonite converts they can't actually, they can convert, but they can't marry in because the Moabites and the Ammonites did not, they didn't display chesed. They didn't go out and greet the Jews when they were coming tired and weary and thirsty. They didn't go out and greet them with bread and water. Um, so they, don't, they didn't have the chesed and they didn't have the hakaratotov, the recognition of the good, the thankfulness that they should have had in recognition for what the Jewish people had done for them in the past. And so they're not allowed to marry in. So do we want 
Do we want that kind of convert in our midst? And once we've made that ruling, they're not allowed. So if it's clear that King David comes from that type of lineage, well, maybe he's not legitimate. Which brings us to, um, I'm going to leave that as a question. Maybe he's not legitimate. Which brings us to an interesting concept of the messianic energy coming through ugly containers. A lineage that has twists and turns that maybe are unpleasant, somebody coming from a nation that shouldn't, a relationship that's weird, uh, all kinds of things. It comes from all these different scary places. It also comes, and and it also comes from hopelessness, from so many places that seem hopeless. I'm not even there's so much not time to go into all the things that I want to, of course. But let's just talk about the hopelessness of Ruth and Naomi and how that seems so hopeless. There's other hopeless places that it looks like. But Mashiach is born, the Messiah is born from hope in the midst of hopelessness as an eternal message to the Jewish people that when we seem hopeless, there's always hope ahead. And that leads us to this particular ugly container, we'll call it, of maybe we don't want that kind of convert, actually leads us to a fourth reason, back to the third reason. We read it now because of the oral law. Because the oral law, even though the written law says no Ammonites, no Moabites, the oral law says no male Ammonites and Moabites, female ones are okay. And so the oral law then, even though it's a little shaky at the time, it's very clear through the oral law that his lineage is just fine. And so part of reading this is the centering of the oral law and its application in our lives then you can't have the written Torah without the oral Torah. They have to go together. So even King David's lineage requires oral law to make it kosher. And finally, we read it during this time because we're headed towards Shavuot. And this is the classic reason, convert season, right? It's the time for all of us, actually. We all converted at that time, which is why we have a tradition of eating dairy for Shavuot. Because since we converted, the meat that we had killed the day before wasn't kosher because it was killed by Gentiles. And now here we are Jews standing um, newly converted at the foot of Mount Sinai and it's time for a dairy. So, but what does that mean? Are we all converts? When we receive the Torah, we all have to choose in. So we're all choice makers at that time. And every year, every day, but certainly every year, we want to stand in being a choice maker to choose in at that time. <clears throat> but that leads me to the next part that I want to discuss. And if somebody can just show me how many minutes I have left, I lost track. Um, it will be helpful for me. What? <laughs> okay. Quickly, the gifts that converts bring. I'm going to speed this part up. Um, so converts bring specific gifts to the Jewish people. Oh, good. Phew. Thank you. <laughs> um, it does say 36 times in the Torah, by the way, to love the convert more times than it says to love Hashem, probably because it's a little harder sometimes because converts can be weird. They come from different places. They use different accents. They have different language. They don't fully understand whatever it is. They, they sometimes can show up and be strange or make us feel uncomfortable, um, but they do have gifts. And it's taken me a long time to see many of the gifts that converts have, but I want to list some of them so that we can see some of the gifts that we can get from converts during this season. So the first one, the first one that's fascinating that Rabbi Rosner talks about, um, that specifically Ruth brought to King David was non-Jewish blood. Believe it or not. I mean, I've thought a lot about how I have a gift for the Jewish people, which is non-Jewish blood, because the Ashkenazic, you know, bottleneck that happened during the Crusades really created a lot of inbreeding that caused a lot of genetic problems for Ashkenazi Jews. And I helped mix that up. So, okay, so there's a genetic gift. But there's also, that's not what they're talking about when the sages talk about non-Jewish blood. It seems that Jews don't rule Jews very well. We're all one people and we're supposed to be one people. So leading the Jews is actually very challenging. And King Saul, who came from all Jewish blood, was a failed king. And King David, who had a little Moabite blood in him, was a capable king. And that non-Jewish blood was necessary in his mixture in order to have the strength to rule properly over the Jewish people. So that's a gift right there. So what does that mean? Non-Jewish blood is mixed into the king that is the father of the Messiah. So let's talk about that in a few minutes, but let's just hold that for a minute. 
of course, the chesed that's mixed in, the loving kindness that Ruth brings in her blood into the Jewish people. And that was a necessary ingredient that was mixed in at that time. But then also there is the shaping of herself, that a convert, every convert has to go through a process in order to receive the Torah. And Jews who are born Jewish don't. They're born right into Torah and they can't leave, right? So there's nothing they have to do. And sometimes things they wanna do to shake it off. But the Gentile who wants to become Jewish has to work so hard to prove to others, yes, I can, I'll follow you. I'll be buried where you're buried. I'll do what you say. I'll go where you go. I'll live how you live. I'll eat what you eat. I'll dress how you dress. I'll, I'll do it really, truly. And they spend a long time shaping themselves so they can receive the Torah. And all of us have to remember, actually it's a constant process to shape ourselves so that we can receive the Torah. Really, that's what every mitzvah is. And I'll give you the Eliza Bulo definition for a mitzvah. A mitzvah is a physical pathway to a spiritual destination. It's the way we walk to transform ourselves. The way we walk is the halacha. Halacha means walking. It's the way that we move in this world physically that leads us to the spiritual place that we want to be. And that's what Ruth did. She walked with Naomi. And that brings us to the next gift of this convert, what she shows and all converts, no one can convert on their own. You must join a Jewish community and you must have a guide. There must be a rabbi, rabbit, and teacher, guide, friend who brings you along. It's not possible to convert without guidance. And actually it's not possible to be in a full, rich, deep Jewish life without teachers by the side and friends around and guidance. We have to enter into relationships of guidance so that we can grow properly, really put, we have this GPS, uh, uh, the Rabbi Niven calls it the, tri the tripod of objectivity around us, a teacher above us, a friend next to us and students below us. We have to have that to triangulate on our position. And um, it's important to set that in place all around us. So Ruth models and converts model that you have to have a guide in your life and how vital that is to make sure that you're walking the way that you're supposed to walk. And you see that with Naomi, how she corrects Ruth in her language and in her position, in, in, her, in her physical movement even. Um, she's corrected gently by Naomi as she grows into her Jewish self. So we all have that opportunity to grow into our Jewish selves. But I think that ultimate gift that's here is that in the end of days, all the nations will come under the wings of the Shekhinah. We're all supposed to be here. We're getting close to the end of days and we're not all showing up. But you know what? Oh, it's a lot of people converting from all over the world. And each convert brings the energy of her nation. A convert from the United States is different than a convert from Mexico, is different than a convert from France, is different than a convert from, from Australia, is different than a convert from Russia. And each one brings her national energy. A piece of the blood of her nation brings into the Jewish people, woven all together. And in the end, there's going to be a king who rules over the Jewish people. What would it be like if there was a king that didn't have any non-Jewish blood in him? All the converts would say, you can't really relate to me. Like you're just focusing on all the Jews who carried it for 3000 years. But actually we have this opportunity to have Mashiach come and has a little non-Jewish blood in there to say, you know what? I relate to everybody. But the final gift of the convert is the possibility of it all because Jews who are born into Judaism are often there because of a sense of responsibility. Whereas you can see in Ruth and in other converts, they didn't turn around and say, oh, wow, I have so much history behind me. I better carry that forward. They looked ahead and they said, wow, do you see what you could do with that Torah? This is amazing. It's a sense of possibility. And it's where I wanna go to transform myself and the rest of humanity. That's what converts bring is that exciting sense of possibility that hopefully we can sprinkle all over the rest of the community and we'll bring together those two strands of what Eli Melech was missing, responsibility, and what converts need to take, responsibility, and move towards a sense of possibility. Thank you so much, Eliza. Um, 
I've, I've heard you speak before about, um, or maybe we've had conversations about this uh, sense of uh, the responsibility of people who are born into uh, the Jewish nation and the sense of possibility. And I, and I, I was really struck by um, what you said about hope out of hopelessness. And I'm wondering if there's something that that sense of hope right, comes, it seems like from that energy of possibility of there, there are ways I, I can be born into one group and I can move into another group. That might also mean that if certain events happen to me, there's, there's also that, that, that possibility. There's always the possibility of moving forward. Okay. Um, thank you, that was so beautiful. And I invite um, anyone who wants to share their own stories of possibility in the chat of ways in which um, something seemed impossible and uh, you were able to find uh, possibility. If you'd like to share that in the chat, please go ahead. Um, our next uh, teacher is Rosita Mavashev. And I want to give a special uh, shout out to Ariel Krul for making the shidduch and putting us together. Thank you. Uh, Rosita is the director of Jewish Life and Engagement at the, is it Tanger or Tanger? Tanger. Tanger Hillel of Brooklyn College. Her Jewish professional life started out with a simple Hillel internship that stemmed into countless fellowships and her Israel involvement. Rosita sits on the DEI committee at Hillel International, representing the Mizrahi and Sephardi professionals, and leads the Hillel International student cohort of Mizrahi and, student, and Sephardi students nationally. You can read the rest of her bio in the chat. Uh, Rosita, we're so happy that you're here to uh, take us on a tour of chapter two of the Book of Ruth, when Ruth and Naomi uh, come to the land of Israel and what happens to them. Thank you. Thank you all. So happy to be here. Um, my name is Rosita Mabashev. Um, I come from a Bukharian community in New York. Um, I just want to preface, I do have Tourette syndrome and like I love to public speak, but it does trigger me. So if I'm blinking or repeating a word, join me for the ride. Okay, so definitely. Um, so when I was told to do chapter two, I was like, I wanna read it and interpret it my way. So I really steered away from looking at as much commentary as possible. And I forced myself to ask myself the question, what do you think this means, right? Like what's the Torah inside of me and how can I share that with you? So I'm gonna take you for, I'm gonna take you for a ride. I got my papers here. We're gonna go through chapter two together. I'm gonna give my side commentary. I welcome you all to drink, to laugh, to come off on, you know, unmute yourselves. So let's do this. So we head into chapter two and chapter two just starts off with um, Naomi and Ruth are in, are in Bethlehem. And there is just a thought, Naomi remembers that she has family of Elimelech you know, still in Bethlehem and the name of Boaz. So that's how it just starts. And it's important to note here that Ruth doesn't know about this. She doesn't know about Boaz. Ruth just followed Naomi. She came, she's there, and that's all she knows. So here we have two powerful single women in the land of Israel with no income. These are women in need. And all of a sudden, Ruth turns to Naomi and she goes, I'm going to go glean in the fields. And when I looked at this, I was like, hold on a second. How does Ruth know about gleaning. Gleaning in Hebrew is leket. And for those of us that don't know, leket is the agricultural Jewish law of as you're harvesting the field, whatever, you know, falls off on the floor. I like to call it whatever falls off the truck. Um, you leave it there so that the community, those in need know, okay, I'm hungry. I need to go. I'm going to go glean the fields. And I'm like, Ruth knew, like Ruth understood the assignment. She did her homework when she converted. She opened, she was like, oh, I have resources. I, there is something for me. So she tells Naomi, I'm going to go do what I got to do. A self-starter right here, queen, okay? So Ruth is out in the field and coincidentally, coincidentally between me and me, she happens to be on Boaz's field, okay? This is fate, ladies and gentlemen, okay? She's on Boaz's field. She's there. She's gleaning. She's very smart. She's following the reapers. Um, and all of a sudden, Boaz shows up in the picture. He is making his debut, ladies and gentlemen, and he's greeting the reapers and he goes, the Lord be with you. And they reply, may the Lord bless you. I'm sorry, but I took a moment and I said, and people only greet me with a high from now on. I would just want to say, may, may you all be blessed and thank you for being here. Right. And now back, back to what we're here for. So um, he spots Ruth, you know, she's doing her thing. Um, he turns to his head fieldman and he goes, 
whose girl is that? Right. I took 15 minutes and I said, whose girl is who? Ruth is her own woman. She is a queen. She's holding her own. But we're understanding that Boaz is, you know, taking interest. You know, I've never seen this woman before. Right. So the, the reaper, you know, answers back. She's the Moabite girl. She came, she came with Ruth. She's from Moab. Right. Just in case you didn't realize she's the Moabite girl from Moab. The Megillah happens to really like it's the labels. Just wanting to let you know she's a Moabite. Okay. So as he's having this conversation, Ruth is whispering to herself, you know, I'm just like, I'm picturing Ruth going, I'm just here to glean. I've been on my feet all day. I had limited rest. I'm getting what, you know, it was meant to be mine, my like it. And I'm just, you know, leave, 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 you know, leave me be. So um, Boaz takes, takes her under his wing. Like this is, this is beautiful leadership. Like she is there alone, right? She's not, she's doing her best in a sense, not to take up space and he's giving her this space, right? She, he takes her under his wing. Um, you know, he tells her, um, uh, stay close to my girls, stay close to my reapers. Don't go gleaning anywhere else. You know, it's all good. BT dubs, by the way, I've ordered the men not to molest you. Um, this is great. And, and then he, after that, he nonchalantly says that. And then he goes, oh, and if you're thirsty, feel free to draw from the water that these same men have, have um, drink from the water they have drawn. I am, I will not lie to you. I sat with this line. I took, it took me four days to put this together, but I sat with this line for 12 hours. And I said, what, what is he trying to say here? Right? Like, is it uncomfortable? Is it not? And then I realized, wait, Boaz is ahead of his time. He understood the nature of his men. And instead of, you know, what we normally see today, going to, to, to Ruth and going, cover up or be more modest. He goes, no, no, no. I'm going to the men. I'm holding them accountable. And I'm saying, excuse me. Hi. Know where you stand. Know where she stands. Understand. It was very, and it was, it was like a checklist. Okay. You won't molest her. Make sure she drinks. Make sure all is good. All is well. And now back to our, you know, our funded story. So now that's going on. And all of a sudden Ruth responds, and she goes, why are you so nice to me, a foreigner? I, ladies, I looked at this and I was like, Ruth, a queen has imposter syndrome. She has converted to Judaism and she has the audacity to say, I kind of don't belong and you're being nice to me. Wow, right? So this kind of also taught me as a leader in the spaces I show up and that that's normal. That is so normal, right? So now Boaz also sets it straight. He goes, Ruth, I know about you. I know about you, hon. I know what you did for Naomi. I know that you made that decision to leave your family, your parents, the place you were born, and you stepped into the unknown. You stepped into a people you didn't know about, right? And he blesses her and he says, may you be blessed. May God reward you. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, wow. Wow, this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful practice of leadership right here. And he sees her, right? So then all of a sudden there's a lunch break. And I tell you now, Boaz also took care of this woman's hunger, okay? He said, come sit next to me. I invite you to eat with me. And then he goes ahead and says, um, don't forget. He goes, dip your morsel into vinegar. And I was like, the Torah doesn't just say things. Why is it telling us to dip your morsel in? First of all, don't tell her what to do. But second of all, why is it, te why is it telling us to dip your morsel into vinegar, right? I, I, I didn't want to look at sources, but I was like, I'm just going to turn over to Rashi for a minute. What does Rashi say about this? Because Rashi's always got something to say. So Rashi goes, Be, by the way, just so you know, fun fact, vinegar in a heat wave replenishes. It, it, it's like the answer to dehydration. And me and my, you know, trust issues, I was like, Rashi, you're going to tell me what vinegar does for me. I'm going to turn to Dr. Google. You know, we all have a moment when we turn to WebMD and we turn into those doctors without those degrees. And I was like, what does Google have to say about vinegar? And lo and behold, Google confirms that if you are ever facing dehydration, a heat stroke, or this is a fun fact for y'all to tackle summer. I'm just letting you know, I'm making a TikTok later. So I'm going to post it. It's all, it's a life hack. But apparently if you're dehydrated, you take a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar, you add it to your water, electrolytes replenished. So I'm just letting you know that Ruth is out here, not only teaching us lessons, but also caring for our well-being. Okay. She's caring for our well-being. Now, Ruth, well, let's continue to our, you know, our programming. Ruth sits beside him. She eats. She is such a classy woman. She leaves a little bit on the plate for later for Naomi. You know how she does. And she goes on. And as Ruth is about to get up and head back, Boaz goes, don't worry. He tells the workers, 
take care of her. And by the way, let a few more pieces of stock just fall off the truck. You know, let make sure she gets what she's needed. Um, she gleans until the, she's a hard worker. I was reading this and I got tired. I took a break to eat with Ruth. I'm just letting you know, this is a lot going on here. So she's gleaning until evening. Um, she's gathered all her stuff. She heads back into town. She is coming in with abundance, ladies and gentlemen. She not only brought in the stocks and the grains, but she even brought in cooked food for Naomi to eat. Like she even was like, hey, it's a long day for me. You think Naomi wants to sit in the kitchen and start getting taken care of these grains? No, we're feeding Naomi too. So she gets there and Naomi is excited. She goes, whoa, wh who did you friend? What is your network? How did you get all this food, right? So she goes, you know, happens to be, I was in this guy Boaz's field and he took care of me. And he, he took me in as part, you know, just to, you know, be part of his family. And Naomi goes, fun fact, Boaz is part of our family. Just she decided to share that nugget then in there. Ruth continues to tell her that, you know, he took care of me. The reapers took care of me. And Naomi's confirming, yes, yes, yes. You stay close to them. Don't bother with other fields. Just stay there, right? And then as chapter two comes to a close, it says Ruth finishes out the harvest season. She gets what she needs. And it literally ends with Ruth is staying at home with Naomi and they're chilling. They're chilling. I'm using the word chilling. Yes, I'm a millennial. So they're sitting they're using the word chilling. So now that, that's how it ends. And I, was, I sat here for a little bit and I was like, what do, it's a whole chapter telling us about Ruth and the leadership of Boaz, but why is it folk? It kept saying gleaning. Why is it focusing on like it? What does like it have to teach us? And it is such a rich lesson that I took from this is that like it is this society. It's the law. It's the Jewish law that allows this society to take care of its people with taking care of their needs without even being asked. How often do we find ourselves being asked for charity or being asked to help? And only upon request do we start to help. But here in this chapter, it sets up the understanding that we must set up a society that is already, already pre-thinking what are the needs of our community? Because oftentimes, and in my line of work, I find that sometimes people don't know how to ask. With the rich, diverse community that is the Jewish peoplehood, it's sometimes not a norm to ask right? Sometimes there's maybe shame, there may be guilt, there may be embarrassment. And here it is like it comes along and like, it's like, no, 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 get it ready before they need it. Get it ready so that they feel comfortable coming. And this is very field of dreams. If you have not watched the movie, I've just aged myself. This is very field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. It is so important to, if you build it, if you haven't watched it, please, if you could take something away from this, watch the movie, but if you build it, they will come. And I was like, that is so beautiful. And how often do we, do we think, oh, we have to be asked. We're sitting around waiting. Like we need to, we need to service. We need to serve. We need to mirror the needs so that that community doesn't have to come. We don't have to wait to the point of ask to the point of crisis and the beauty of it all. And what I love the most is when Ruth came back into town, she was so excited. There was no shame. There was no embarrassment. She felt heard. She felt served. She felt protected. She, she knew she was going to be okay. And that is because it was, there was a society, a community that was set up to serve her. And that to, that to me is, well, I personally grew up in a Bukharian household and we grew up, you know, working poor and I'm taught, and it's so important. A lot of the times I didn't know how to ask, but I, I was blessed to walk into certain communities and organizations that were already ready for me before I opened up to ask. And I want to end with a little mushal, a little parable that I heard years back, but I'm also going to put my spin on it because I'm obviously not going to do it word for word. I'm going to do it my way. But I also want to say that I spent the day, like I wanted to give credit to where this mushal came to. And Wikipedia was surprisingly the answer to this. Apparently it's a mushal attributed by Rav Chaim from Ram Shishak. I don't know where that is. I don't know much about him, but feel free to Google that. So this is the little, little, little mushal. Uh, a, little, a lovely human individual, let's, let's call her Jane lives her full 120 years in this world and passes on and goes, goes to the pearly gates. She prances upon the pearly gates. She's sitting in the beautiful waiting room. The couches are comfortable. She's sitting there and the angel comes up to her and says, hey, Jane, um, you're about to go into judgment, but you know, we're all about, you know, being transparent up here. So we're just going to give you a tour of what the outcomes of judgment might be for you. So you can best prepare yourself that when you get the verdict, you know what to expect. And how this works is we're going to start with a tour in hell, and then we're going to go on for a tour in heaven, and then you're going to be ready for your judgment. So Jane is walking through heaven and surprisingly, the grass is green. The sun is shining. Everything looks pretty. The weather is fine. You don't even need sunscreen because at that point we're not, we're not, we're just there to tan and look pretty. So all of a sudden 
they get to the cafeteria and Jane walks in and she sees so much food, food overload. And it's beautiful. And she sees, you know, but she looks at the tables and everyone's sitting with a plate full of food and they look miserable. And she doesn't understand why they look miserable until she looks down and sees that the spoons, the utensils they're given to eat is really long and cannot reach their mouth. So they have all this food in front of them and they cannot eat from these spoons. And she's like, wow, this is miserable. Like, how do you eat this? Like, this is hell. So then they're done with their tour of hell and they end up in heaven. And Jane walks in, she goes, wow, the grass is green here too. This is really, this, this doesn't look that different than hell. And then they walk into the cafeteria and right in the cafeteria, the food is amazing. It, it she's wow, like they have the same menu down in hell. I'm wondering what I lived good for. And all of a sudden she under, she looks at the table, but people don't look miserable. They look happy and they're eating. And she's wondering, how is that possible? The spoons she noticed also on her way in were the same. They're these long spoons. And she realizes that they have realized how to use a spoon is by feeding the neighbor next to them. They realize that they, if they feed the neighbor next to them, they will eat because that's each person is taking care of the one next to them. They understand that they will eat too. The word natan in Hebrew, I, I forgot what the word in English is, a paleodrum, where it's the same word backward and forward, right? Um, I'm totally butchering the word and I have an English degree, so don't tell, don't tell my college. But in natan is as you're giving, it's the same word back where you're getting. And they realize that as we feed our neighbor, we eat. So my parting words to you as we close chapter two and we learn from this queen that is, that is Ruth is that you... Um, I wrote it down so nicely. I want to make sure I say it is that may we all understand the power of our spoon. May you all not only understand the power of your spoon, but practice the power of your spoon. Cause as they say, again, if you build it, they will come. So let us let it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosita. Um, I, I love this idea of, of looking at chapter two and seeing Leket and seeing the ways that society was there to serve even, even the stranger, even the vulnerable. And I invite everyone, to, if you'd like to share in the chat, um, ways in which society has been there for you or for your loved ones, or ways in which the things that we need, the organizations that we need to build to in order for our society to be there for us and for, for the needs of others. So if you'd like to put that in the chat, uh, feel free. In the meantime, I'm going to introduce our next teacher, um, Rabbi Shuli Passau, who's going to teach us chapter three. Rabbi Shuli is a Jewish educator and communal professional currently serving as the director of community engagement at B'nai Jeshurun in New York City. In this role, she brings her background in community organizing to oversee Israel, social justice, and chesed programming, builds new opportunities and pipelines for lay leadership, and develops innovative structures to engage and connect synagogue members. Uh, and you can see the rest of her bio in the chat. Um, at this point in our story, uh, as, you, as you've heard, Ruth has been to the field of Boaz and she's had that in, um, first interaction with them, uh, but then nothing is happening. So now they got to do something. Uh, and so um, Rabbi Shuli Paso, we'll, we'll take it over from here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Eliza. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to be learning together. Um, I just want to say in terms of my own uh, approach to learning text and, and studying text, one of the things that I love deeply or two things I love deeply uh, are one, comparing texts in the Torah to other texts. Uh, and Eliza, you reference this at the beginning of the comparison that some people make between the book of Ruth and the book of Job of both stories that start in despair and then have very different trajectories. Um, and there's always something to learn from comparing one story to something it might remind us of elsewhere in the Tanakh. Um, and we're going to see that that's really important here um, in, in the book of Ruth and in chapter three in particular. Um, and the other thing that I love, and this, this happens a little bit more in, in the Talmud, but, but could certainly happen uh, in Tanakh as well, and we will see it here, is that women in particular who are very much on the margins of society in terms of their power, their role, their authority, um, often through stories end up being the ones who 
make everything go right, who make society go on the path toward justice, um, who sometimes even subvert the law to do that. Um, and through these narratives, we see many of the ways that women's voices, um, we want to lift them up from the text and see how we can learn from them. So that's what I want to do a little bit this evening uh, in looking at chapter three. And I'm actually going to, we're going to look at this chapter together. This is the racy chapter, very sexy chapter. So get ready. Um, we're going to look at this chapter together. I, I have a, a Google Doc with a lot of text that we're not going to go through, but I will put the link in the chat in case you want to look at it in your own uh, browser. Um, but I'm also going to share my screen here to look at there we go. So I titled this Deception and Seduction in the Story of Ruth um, and realized that there should have been a question mark. Deception and seduction in the story of Ruth? That's the question we want to have going into chapter three. Uh, and as we just wonderfully heard from Rosita, this, this whole encounter with Boaz and the gleaning and Ruth begins to establish herself in this relationship and as a presence um, amongst the people, the others who are gleaning. But as Eliza said, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Boaz has not made a move yet. And so here we have Naomi. I was like, all right, I'm just going to take matters into my own hands. Daughter, I must seek a home for you where you may be happy. There's Boaz. Go get him. He's going to be on the threshing floor tonight. Verse three, so bathe, anoint yourself, dress up and go down to the threshing floor, but do not disclose yourself to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he lies down and go over and uncover his feet and lie down. So what is happening here? Is Naomi telling Ruth to, you know, just kind of, get in there and cozy up to Boaz and start to have a conversation with him? Or is uncovering his feet a euphemism for something much more uh, intimate? And Ruth goes and does what Naomi tells her. She says, I'll do everything you tell me. She goes to the threshing floor. Boaz ate and drank and in a, he was in a cheerful mood. He went to lie down beside the grain pile and she went over stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, the man gave a start and pulled back. There was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. And she replied, I am your handmaid, Ruth. Spread your robe over your handmaid for you are a redeeming kinsman. I'm not going to read the rest of the text together, but this is the beginning of the beginning of the end, the beginning of how Ruth and Boaz uh, get together, and uh, as as we'll see it and see in chapter four, begin to build the family that creates the uh, ultimately the lineage that uh, produces King David and the messianic uh, heirs to that throne. So I want to just ask for you know if you are um, able to put in the chat right now, what do you think? Do you think that Ruth and Naomi were being a little scandalous, a little seductive, um, or do you think this was innocent and they were following the rules, but maybe just nudging things along a little bit? Did Ruth, or put it to put it differently, did Ruth uncover Boaz's feet, or did she uncover a different part of his body? What do you think when reading? When reading, so put, we've got some folks putting in the chat. Um, seductive in the best way. Feet makes me think of Halitza. Isn't Ruth asking for Boaz to do Yibum? Okay, so that's exactly right. Just without getting into all the intricacies of what Yibum is. Yibum is, a, is when uh, a man dies childless and uh, his brother or next closest relative marries his widow. And there is an aspect to that or can be an aspect to that that has to do with um, taking off your sandal. And so maybe that's what the uncovering the feet is, that it's, it's innocent. She's nudging him along in this process, which will result in him marrying her. Um, so it's seductive. She's begging him. She spoke his language. Okay. He woke with a start. That tells us something, right? She was, she was active in this moment. Okay. So we're going to see what the rabbis have to say about this in a little bit. But when we read this story, we might 
bring to mind or we might uh, recall other stories from Tanakh where we have not so different situations of women engaging men in some kind of intimate or sexual relationship um, in some kind of deceptive or perhaps inappropriate way. We're not gonna look at those texts inside together, but they're in the, the Google doc. Um, so I'll just kind of summarize the first one uh, from the book of Genesis is the story of Lot and his daughters. After Lot and his family leave the city of Sodom, which is then destroyed because of its uh, immorality, impropriety, inhospi unhospitality, inhospitality. Um, they go to this place and his daughters think that the world has been destroyed. The world has been destroyed. So it must be up to them to repopulate. So what do you do if the only man around is your father? You get him drunk or wait till he gets drunk and then you have relations with your father because that's the only way to repopulate the earth. And in fact, that is what Lot's daughters do. And to go back to something that Eliza noted earlier on, um, one of the main um, identifying factors of Ruth is that she comes from the tribe of Moab. And the tribe of Moab is the tribe that is birthed literally from this relationship between Lot and one of his daughters. So we have a relationship that is incestuous. Later on in the Torah, we're going to be told this type of relationship is expressly completely forbidden. And it results in, if not the repopulation of the world, <laughs> because other people were in fact still alive, um, what his daughters thought were the, was the repopulation of the world, including two significant tribes um, at this time and in the history of the Jewish people. So that's the first story that it reminds us of, or reminds me of. And by the way, there are lots of stories that we could connect to here, but I'm just bringing two. Um, the other one is also a story from Genesis, which is the story of Yehuda and Tamar. Um, Yehuda is uh, married. He has three sons. Um, his wife dies. Um, his, his son marries a woman named Tamar. Um, he dies. She marries the second uh, so his second son, he dies, and they have not had any children yet, right? So this is the third third time's a charm, maybe, but Yehuda's not so excited about uh, giving his third son to Tamar because, you know, she doesn't have a great track record with his sons, um, and also his third son is a little young at the time. So, you know, he, he holds him back and keeps him at home and tells her to go back to her father's house, and Tamar is like, no. I need to perpetuate this lineage. I am not gonna sit here while Yehuda tells me that I can't have children with this, this lineage, this line of people. And so she dresses up as a prostitute. She goes and she sits in the, the intersection and she seduces Yehuda and he ends up sleeping with her. And if you read the story, you'll see that he ultimately comes to recognize that um, that he, that she did seduce him and he was in the wrong and she was in the right. And she becomes pregnant from this union. And who does she give birth to? Twins, one of whom is Peretz. And Peretz, as we find out in chapter four, is the great, 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 how many generations back grandfather of Boaz. So we have these two stories from the Torah that are similar to this story here in chapter three in that we're reading about relationships that are not condoned by the Torah. We have a father and daughters. Uh, we have a, a woman and her father-in-law, also a relationship that in the book of Leviticus is forbidden by the Torah. But in both of these situations, the Torah seems to be if not celebrating, at the very least, this seems to be a good thing that these relationships happen, that these sexual encounters happen, that these uh, children were born, and ultimately the lineage from both of these children go to Moab, which is Ruth, and Boaz, 
And then together they create the lineage of David, um, of, of King David and um, ultimately the, the Mashiach, the Messiah. So in both of the situations in Sefer Breshid, in the book of Genesis, I would say that the Torah is showing us how, yes, each case is legitimate. There is a legitimate reason for this otherwise inappropriate sexual relationship, but each case is marred. It's marred because the relationship itself is illicit, and there's a lack of knowledge. There really is deception here. It seems very clear that Lot's daughters deceive him. He doesn't know. The text tells us a couple of times with the case of Yehuda and Tamar, she's very clearly um, covering up her identity. He doesn't know who she is. And the most important thing that I would say, and this is really a point that I, I learned from uh, Dr. Yael Ziegler, who's a wonderful teacher of, of Tanakh uh, in Israel, is that they both, both Lot and Yehuda, turn away from Avraham in some sense. Lot, we know, like physically, they have a fight. He has a fight with his, with his uncle and he says, all right, you're gonna go live here and I'm gonna go live here. Uh, and so they, he turns away. And spiritually, he turns away also. Elisa, you talked about this at the beginning in, in chapter one of like Sodom is the, and, and Moab are the, um, they're the antithesis of chesed. They're the antithesis of hospitality. Avraham, we know, is the antithesis of, <laughs> the thesis of, <laughs> of, of um, hospitality and of chesed, right? We, that is really hit part of his uh, incredible identity, how he's portrayed in the Torah, how he's portrayed in the, in the Midrash and rabbinic texts. So Lot turns away literally and spiritually from Avraham. Yehuda also turns away. It is clear he goes and he marries a Canaanite woman. He separates from his brothers. He turns away from that ancestry. And that's another way in which these two stories from the book of Genesis are, I would say, marred in some way. And this story in Ruth comes along to both um, affirm women's power and the decision to take matters into their own hands when the men who technically have the control and have the authority and have all the power in the society are not doing what they're supposed to do to move everything forward as it should be done. So we have again, yet again, women's, women's uh, leadership and, and power in this way, but it's a tikkun. It is a correction for the elements of the two previous stories in the book of Breshit that had this marring, that had this element that wasn't okay. Um, one, because um, it's not an illicit relationship, right? In fact, it, it, suppo it seems to be a relationship that she should be entering into by virtue of the fact that he has this connection to her family and can be a redeemer in this sense through the, the process of Yibum. It's also very different because while at first there seems to be some deception, as people noted in the chat, very quickly, her identity is revealed. He says, who are you? And she says, Anochi Ruth, I am Ruth. I am gonna tell you right now who I am and why I am here. Put your cloak on me. I want you to play, to be in this role. I'm gonna be totally upfront about what I'm doing here which doesn't really seem to be the dynamic between Lot's daughters and their father and between Tamar and Yehuda until later on in, in that story. And the, the third way in which this is a tikkun, a, a sort of correction, um, and again, Eliza, going back to many of the things that you, that you said in, in your presentation, Ruth is the embodiment of chesed and she is turning herself and the entire entirety of the Jewish people really back toward the path of chesed. Her ancestors or the ancestors, her ancestors and then ultimately the ancestors of her, um, of, of her progeny turned away from chesed. They turned away from Avraham and everything that he stood for. And she brings the people back. She brings the people back to chesed. 
So I want to say three things about this um, about this chapter. Um, one, repeating but I think it's important that we really see the tremendous power and role of women in shaping not just their own destiny, but ultimately what is the destiny of the entire people. King David would not have been born if it hadn't been for the actions of Lot's daughters, the actions of Tamar, the actions of Naomi and Ruth, we see that the women, people who are generally thought of, not just thought of, they are on the margins of society in terms of the amount of power that society accords them, they create and shape this destiny that results in the Davidic line and in the Messianic line. And redemption will ultimately come from these actions that these women have taken. They might not, it might be, you know, slightly unusual means that they, that they use, but that is, is if, again, if not celebrated, um, at least it is uh, recognized and lifted up by the Torah. The second thing, and this is again to um, building on something that uh, Eliza mentioned about King David's shady lineage, right? Here we see that his lineage is shady on both sides. It's shady on his mother's side because she came from Moab. She came from this incestuous relationship with uh, Lot and his daughters. And it's shady on his father's side because Boaz was a descendant of the child who was born to Ye Huda and Tamar. And this suggests to us, as you said, Eliza, that, that even what is the most, what ultimately becomes the most forbidden relationships that the Torah can imagine can produce something extraordinary, something redemptive, something truly, truly holy. But and this is the third thing I'll say, the tikkun is necessary. It's not just that someone from Moab and someone who descended from Yehuda and Tamar went off and had their own children who became the king. Ruth brings that, brings that reality, that not so pretty, little messy, little fuzzy, little shady history. And Boaz brings that too. And together they make a tikkun. They re-embrace the values of chesed. That word is used a number of times in, uh, in the book of Ruth. And it's how the book of Ruth is, is often described in rabbinic literature as teaching us this value of chesed. And it's, it's necessary. So our past can, should never define us. Our past, what has come before us, doesn't have to determine our future. But I think one of the messages of this chapter is that it's incumbent upon us to look at our past and to see where do we have the agency to make a tikkun, to take a step, to take ourselves, our families, our societies even, a step closer to chesed, because that's what's necessary for David to ultimately be born. He's born from these two people who have shady past, but they draw, learn from that to change their, um, their ways and embrace this essential quality of chesed. And I think that's also just a, um, you know, an idea that I'm really holding today is many of us are feeling so uh, helpless and looking at the past, the recent past and the not so recent past of this country and saying, like, our past is beyond shady. I mean, this is horrible what keeps happening and can we ever move beyond this? And there's a little bit of hope here. There's a sense that we can't erase it. And it's okay that, it's not okay that that happened, but it doesn't prevent things from becoming better. But we have to take that agency to create the tikkun. And that's what Ruth does in this moment and symbolically does for the whole Jewish people. And in that way, I hope can be an inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Shuli. Um, I was also thinking a lot about uh, the events of the recent past um, while you were speaking and, and thinking that sometimes we feel hopeless because the, the path that we assume is the right, is the way to go just seems blocked, right? Like 
I, I don't see the, the straight path forward. But these models of these women tell us that you can have really creative, um, interesting paths, right? You don't, it doesn't always happen that, that um, the change happens with the straightforward path. And I, I'm, really, I'm really taking that uh, with me. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. And uh, if anybody else is taking any other lessons uh, or anything else that they're thinking about um, from these first three chapters that they want to share with the rest of us, um, please do in the chat. Uh, finally, we are up to chapter four. And uh, at this point, uh, Ruth and Boaz have had their encounter on the threshing floor. And Boaz has taken responsibility. He said, I'm going to do something about this. Um, but now we move from the very personal relationships that we've seen in the first three chapters. And now we're going to the fourth chapter where Boaz needs to get it done with the bureaucracy, with the, with the officials. He needs to make everything official. Um, and so chapter four takes us through that kind of legal proceeding and then takes us to the happy uh, end of the chapter where Ruth has a baby. Um, our teacher uh, for chapter four is Rabbi Dr. Erin Leib Smokler. She is a faculty member at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. She is also the Dean of Students and the Director of Spiritual Development at Yeshivat Maharat, where she teaches, teaches Hasidism and Pastoral Torah, and a faculty member at the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. And you can see the rest of her bio in the chat. Um, Rabbi Erin, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, okay, thank you. I'm so glad to be last because I've had the joy of learning from um, such wonderful women. So thank you. Um, challenge of being last also that some of the themes that I uh, wanted to highlight have already been talked about. So I'm going to pick up on some wonderful things that have already been said and add a twist. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so we can look at some parts of chapter four. Um, which, as Aliza said, uh, brings us to the climax. Boaz and Ruth um, indeed you know, consummate their marriage and indeed they have a baby. Um, and that baby seems to be claimed by one and all. Um, and so here we have, I just excerpted a few of the verses. Um, all the people at the gate and the elders answered, we are, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built up the house of Israel, prosper in Ephrata and perpetuate your name in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar bore to Judah, as uh, Rabbi Shuli just taught us. Through the offspring, which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz married Ruth, she became his wife, and he cohabited with her, the Lord let her conceive, and she bore a son. And then we have the naming of this child and the lineage that has already been referenced several times um, that takes us really to the, to the end of this story. The women neighbors gave him a name, right? So this is a child that sort of belongs to the whole community in a way. The women neighbors gave him a name saying, a son is born to Naomi. You know, the son is born to Naomi, even though the son is born to Ruth. Um, interesting uh, dynamics there. Um, <clears throat> they named him Oved. He was the father of Jesse or Yishai, father of David. This is the line of Peretz. Peretz begot Hezron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and finally, again, you see Oved begot Jesse and Jesse begot David. And this is where our story ends. Um, and what I wanted to, what I wanted to do is just to focus for a moment um, on the, this lineage as it is constructed here and the importance, again, as uh, we've, we've seen already, um, the importance of the house of parrots and why it is that David, who is identified as the uh, progenitor of the, you know, of the Mashiach, why it is that that gets lodged in the house of, of parrots. So um, Rabbi Shuli already took us there. I want to add one more dimension to the intertwining of these stories, the intertwining of the story of Tamar and Yehuda, who bear, who together bear parrots, whose name, by the way, means to break through. Um, he's a breakthrough character. He himself is seen as something of a, um, 
I don't know, not, aggressive isn't the right word, but he does things also um, in unusual ways, um, as you can see in the text in a moment. Um, and so why is it that that lineage is so profoundly rooted here? I wanna take us one story back, if that's okay. Um, and so here we have uh, the site, this story of the uh, Tamar Nuda. Um, but interestingly, what I note here is the actual location of that story of seduction, right? That story of a woman who's making a claim, who's breaking boundaries, who is trying to find a way in when men don't want her to be there necessarily. Um, and the story takes place in a location that is called Timna. Highlighted here, it's highlighted here. Um, right, a, a, a long time afterwards, she was daughter, the wife of Yudah died. When, when his period of mourning was over, Yudah went up to Timna to his sheep shearers, together with his friend Fira, the Adulamite. And Tamar was told, your father-in-law is coming up to Timna for the sheep shearing. Okay, and she stands at a place called a Naim, which is like eyes. She seems to be, this seems to connect some way to a vision that she might have. Um, and again, it's on the road to Timna. The repetition of this phrase brought to mind for me another reference. Um, and I wanna share that with you tonight. Um, and that is also in Breishit, um, a reference to a, another woman another woman whose name is Timna. This woman comes to us from, let's say, a different line. And here we meet her. Um, I'll just read this line in Hebrew. Right, so these are, this is in the context of listing the lineage of Asav, not Jacob's line, but Asav's line. These are the names of Asav's son, Eliphaz is one of them. And then here you see Timna was a concubine of Asav's son, Eliphaz, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. I'm guessing that, that the name of their child, Amalek, might bring us back to our earliest references to um, you know, Mahlon and Chilion, um, though these, Amalek would come to mean, I think, something um, more treacherous, right? Amalek is the seed of all evil in our tradition. Right, it's the you know Haman will be from Amalek, and we have a a, um, a mitzvah a commandment to wipe out the name of Amalek. These are the baddies, and their mom, <laughs> Amalek's mom, is a woman whose name is Tima. Now, here's something interesting about her, according to the midrash, um, or according to the Talmud here in, in Masecha Sanhedrin. Um, one other detail about Timna is that she is Lotan's sister. Why does that matter? Well, we shall see here. Timna was Lotan's sister. And what is this? Timna was a princess. It is written, Chief Lotan, Chief Timna. And chief indicates a monarch who does not wear a crown. She's, in, she's royalty. Timna wanted to convert. Timna wanted to convert. She appeared before the highest court of the land the imaginary court of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, but they would not accept her. So she went and became the concubine of Eliphaz, Asav's son, saying, I would rather be a maidservant with this people than a lady with another. From this union came Amalek, Israel's tormentor. Why? Because they should not have rejected her. Okay. So um, I want to pause here for a moment. I'm going to stop the screen share. Sorry. Okay. Um, just to, to note this added detail and thus added confluence of stories. We're talking, of course, primarily about Ruth, right? And Ruth the convert and then centrality of this lineage or the... Of, of the, sorry, the messianic era being rooted in, right, a story of conversion. When we trace these stories back, right, David who's linked to Peretz and Peretz who's linked to Tamar and Tamar whose story takes place in Timnah. Timnah who is a person who was a 
convert someone who, let's say, wanted to convert, a rejected convert, right? And the story of a rejected woman, right, here is a story of somebody who decides, I want to tie in my, I want to throw my lot in with these people somehow, and I'm going to do it any way I can. And if it, even if it means actually being somebody's concubine, I would rather that than be like live in a land of royalty um, outside of these people. And so she takes this path kind of, um, you know, peripheral, right? She's not, she doesn't join, she can't join the line of Jacob. So she instead joins the line of Asav. And the result of that union is Amalek. Now, what I think is so incredibly fascinating about that, right, is the story that the rabbis are choosing to tell about the consequences, right, of not welcoming the stranger, right? The consequences of not welcoming the stranger are that we birth our own enemies, right? The, en- the birth of the paradigmatic Jewish enemy is found in, right, you can say a scorned woman, but most importantly, I don't think that the point is is gendered per se, though obviously we can't ignore it, right? But it's what happens when we turn away the stranger is we hurt the stranger and we profoundly hurt ourselves as a community, right? And the opposite then, right, the tikkun, as Rabbi Shuli said before, the tikkun for that is the welcoming of the stranger, right? And these just diametrically opposed opposites of when we welcome a stranger, we can birth the Messiah, right? And when we don't welcome the stranger, we actually birth our our enemies, our demons. Um, So there's something very, very, very important, right? As has been said by all our speakers tonight, right? About Ruth as convert, as the mother of the Messiah, right, as the story of our own collective redemption, right, must take place through these, right, powerful women and through the rectification, the tikkun of the strivings of one of them long ago. I want to share one other uh, story slash parable uh, slash text with you that one more time and in a different way asks the same question um, that we have been playing with all night. And that is, why is the gear so profoundly important for the redemption? And here is a different perspective. It comes to us from a Hasidic source, Sorry, here it is. The Gal Machana Ephraim is the was the uh, the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, and he here is commenting on um, a verse from Parshat Bahar, which was just behind us, um, which talks about gerim, gerim potentially of another kind. Ger is the term that we tend to use for convert, but it really does mean stranger, alienated one, perhaps unlanded one. The land must not be sold beyond reclaim, for the land is mine. You are but strangers, Gerim, resident, Toshavim, with me, with God. Here's how the Degel Machane Ephraim reads this verse. He says, in this, there is a hint to a teaching I heard from a wise man on the verse from Psalms. I am a ger in the land. Do not hide your commands from me. Ger anochi ba'aretz al taster mimenu mitzvotacha. It is a known feature of this world that one who is a ger does not have anyone to be close to and to draw near to and to tell about all that happened to him or her and what is in their heart. Since they do not have a friend, neither in Israel nor among the nations, but when one sees a fellow Ger, then each one can tell the other all that has happened. 
And it is known that the Holy Blessed One is like a gear in this world because the divine does not have anyone upon whom to rest the divine presence since we humans are limited. This is the meaning of David's prayer. I am a gear in the land. I too do not want to be a resident in this world. I am also just a gear, just a stranger in it. Therefore, do not hide your commands from me like one gear to another who tells them everything in their hearts. This is the meaning of the verse in Leviticus. You are but strangers and residents with me, with God. When you are a gear in this world and a resident in the next, then you are with me. Because I too, says God, am a gear in this world and therefore will not hide from you my commandments. I think here we have an altogether different perspective on gay roots. On, right, on what it means to be different, other, strange, alien, right? And why it is that redemption comes from there. And the suggestion of this Hasidic text is that the position of gay roots, right, is not the position of the converts per se or alone, right? But we are all gay rim right, as Aliza started us off by saying, we're all gay reem on Shavuot, but we're all gay reem all the time, right, because we are all in some ways alienated, in some ways not fully integrated um, in this world. And when we tap into our otherness, we actually have an opportunity to tap into sort of the grand otherness, capital O, of God, God's self. And that the, those 36 times of love the stranger, right, are 36 times of saying, right, love the stranger within yourselves, love the strangers within your midst, and love the ultimate stranger who is God. When you connect to God, when you can commune with God in your own feelings of alienation, right, you actually might open up tremendous portals to, to redemption. So our time is up. I want to sort of bring these two vantage points together. And I hope in so doing, it actually helps to bring so many of the themes that we all talked about tonight together, uh, which is on the one hand, right, the kind of unorthodox ways um, that women's spiritual strivings might actually bring us forward. And then also the ways in which the character of the gear and the quality of gay roots of strangeness or strangerness or otherness can actually be understood as a deep nida or a deep attribute of God, God's self, um, and that the pathway to redemption might actually come through those points of alienation and through our embrace of alienated ones. So with that, I will end and say hug sameach. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Aaron, and thank you to all of our teachers. This has been so incredible. I'm kind of, um, my head is spinning from everything. Um, and I, I'm still, I'm just trying to, to take in all that you have all said and try to apply it to what's going on in the world now, because you've all described different elements of what it means to have a redeemed world and to bring redemption to a world. And we are in need of redemption. Um, and I think so many of us are feeling so stuck at this moment. And I'm wondering if what we learned tonight can kind of unstuck us um, and help us kind of think a little bit more broadly about, I can't, I can't reverse what happened. Um, and I don't see a straightforward path where, where things might be different, but maybe there are things that we could do, ways that we could build our society, ways that we could be receptive to leaders who could come forward, or new thinking that could come forward, or start building in those structures in place that, that, that could lead to a redeemed world. Um, and I, I'm going to be thinking about all this, I think, over Shavuot and for a while to think about what are the lessons, right? What are the lessons, especially what do we need to do now? Like what can we do within our own communities to create those structures so that the redemption can come and won't be turned away? Um, so I thank you all. Thank you so much for your beautiful Torah. 
Um, thank you, Ariella, as usual, for all your incredibly hard work. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being part of our community and, uh, and joining us tonight. And now I'm going to hand it over to Ariella. Hey, um, I'm not going to. I'll thank our teachers in private because I just want to spend hours just saying thank you um, for filling me in just the right ways today and giving me so much food for thought that I'm excited to have all of this Torah keep me up all night. This is the kind of Torah that I want keeping me up all night. Um, I want to just give a, a nod to Aviva Perlo, who's a, a, a Siva person who I don't know if she was traveling, so I don't know if she was able to stick around and be here on her phone. Um, but she's the founding director of Creative Coping. She's a social worker, an artist, and a writer, um, and a survivor of gun violence herself. Um, she's developed training and violence prevention and teaches all over the place. Um, and she was one of the first people I thought to reach out to um, just in terms of asking how, how to channel any sort of energy. Um, I'm going to put an article about her in a link in the chat, and I'll send it out afterward also. Um, and I just asked her for two resources um, that she would recommend as a place to kind of go to for information or just learning or a place to feel like one could help. Um, and I also wanted uh, to share, Aliza actually had a really beautiful idea um, in terms of turning to busy hands and taking one little step towards action. Um, here we go. These are two mailing addresses. And um, there are people who, I don't know, might appreciate a letter. Just being known, being seen. So I can send those addresses out as well. Um, but just to let everybody go on their merry way um, and say thank you again for being here tonight. I'm gonna make a gentle ask